Arizona Wildlife Views, brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Welcome to Arizona Wildlife Views. I'm Jim Paxson. Tonight we'll go out to the Ben Avery shooting facility for a fun shoot with Operation Homefront. Then Michael McFarlane will show us how to use drop shot to catch bass. This wasn't a very good year for wildflowers, but we did manage to find a few. But first, remember when the dam burst at Tempe Town Lake and all the reconstruction efforts? Come along, we'll show you the latest renovation. All right. No net handy, you're just gonna pull them up. Up in the boat, baby. All right. And there you go. There's Fishing one the is fantastic in Arizona, but our desert lakes have a dirty little secret. They've lost their underwater attire. Hidden far under the shimmering blue surface, you'll see nothing. Hardly a stick, tree stump, or even cactus skeleton is left standing. Impounded decades ago, most of our lake bottoms now resemble bathtubs. And that's a serious problem for young fish trying to survive to adulthood. Many of our reservoirs are 60, 70, 80 years old or more. And the habitats that were found once the reservoir filled are pretty much gone. And so imagine, if you will, your living room without any furniture in it. And that's a lot of the times what fish see. Fish aren't unlike us in, in that way where they you know, like to have a place to, to hang out, a couch, so to speak, to sit next to or to, uh, to hide behind. Over the years, the department and numerous volunteer angling groups have attempted to give fish something to hide in by adding artificial habitats, including Christmas trees. Traditionally, um, we have used uh, trees, and uh, it's real common around Christmas time to get loafed over Christmas trees and place them as fish habitat, and, and that habitat works very well, but for a limited time. Typically, uh, Christmas trees are around for less than 10 years, and then they uh, decay and, and they just become part of the, the food chain, and, and we have to come back constantly and try to resupply that. One of the things that exacerbates the, the use of woody debris for, for uh, habitat is, is the fact a lot of our reservoirs vary in, in uh, lake level quite, quite extraordinarily. So if you think about some of the, the lake level uh, variations that you see in uh, Lake Pleasant, for example, every year you'll see a, a big part of that reservoir down and, and a lot of the habitat we put out there would be exposed. Another favorite artificial habitat used in our waters is plastic of various shapes and sizes all designed to attract and hold game fish. While they work great, they are a little pricey. What we've come up with here, and this is something that we're, we plan to try here in Arizona, is the use of these reef balls. Well, these are reef balls. They were primarily originally developed for the uh, marine environment to make artificial coral reefs. But we're finding that they work really well for freshwater fish habitat as well. These reefs have some interesting characteristics that could greatly benefit our lakes. The main thing is the longevity. 500 years, they're not gonna go anywhere, stability, uh, and you can tweak them to species specific. So we can start making some modifications for juvenile fish, for adult fish, for bass, for catfish. We can make all kinds of different changes to them once we uh, get started and find out what habitat we're trying to replicate. These reefs are made with type two Portland cement with some special additives. And to it, we add microsilica, which is also fly ash, and that adds strength to it as well as just the pH of the concrete, so it's more, or more natural, more balanced pH. And then we add fibers to it. Other than that, it's a pretty straight concrete mix, and you mix it like you're ready to pour a basement or a sidewalk. And then just before you're ready to pour, we add a plasticizer, which makes the concrete uh, more liquid, so it'll actually go into the mold better and, and fill in all the gaps, but it doesn't lose any strength. Once the concrete is mixed, it gets hand poured into the mold. The molds are three pieces that get put together, 
and then there's pins to keep them from being blown apart with the concrete when it's added. And the balls add the holes and the void area in the center, which is the main habitat for the fish. One of the greatest benefits to the reefs is the ability to modify the mold design for specific types of fish, including a safe haven for the fry. With a couple of them here, we're putting a mesh inside of so small fry can go in there and predators can't get in. And if the young get eaten, we're not going to have any adult fish. So hopefully the, the growth rates will go up with this and the survival rates will go, up, will go up with this. I also see a lot of flexibility in this type of structure where it could be catered to certain applications. If you want it for more adult spawning fish, you can make the holes larger. And then territorial fish like largemouth bass will set up on that and call it theirs. And then they'll, their survival rate will go up. But I just see a lot of flexibility in this with the way it's poured and, and different materials that are added to where you could really make it fit in certain situations. The center bladder is installed and filled with air. Concrete will be poured into the void left behind. But shelter is only one component fish need in order to survive. The fish will go to a habitat. The problem is they go to the habitat and there's no food. So you also have to provide food for them, not just housing. So these balls are designed to grow algae on them, which will then bring in the little creatures and the habitat underneath to bring in the crayfish. So we provide not only housing, but also food as well. Plus it, you know, when you're down there and you're looking at it, it doesn't look like a junkyard. And, there, and it's more purposely designed for these particular species of fish. As an angler, uh, what we expect to see here is uh, certainly uh, enhance the fishing uh, unilaterally for the uh, average recreational angler. We've got bass and catfish and uh, other species that have come down from uh, the waterfill. And uh, with the uh, advent of these reef balls, it's going to create some pretty nice uh, habitat for the fish to live, spawn, and uh, reproduce, ultimately uh, giving a pretty good uh, urban setting, if you will, for uh, family uh, fishing opportunities and, and an average re recreational angler. Once the reefs are constructed and allowed to cure overnight, they need to get transported to the water. Since they weigh over a ton each, moving them could be interesting. The first step is to put the center air bladder back in place and inflate it. An additional air bladder is affixed to the outside. Ropes are attached to the air bladder. A forklift carries it to the water's edge where it is gently placed as far as possible into the water. The idea is that the air in the bladder will help the reef ball float. After much testing, though, it was determined that the air bladder wasn't giving it enough buoyancy, so another was added, and the reef begins its journey. The boat eventually tows the ball to its final resting place. Okay, that's about as fast as you can tow it. Placement of the reefs is critical. The most important consideration? Put them just inside where I can cast. Generally, I like to put them in a place where anglers can reach out towards the habitat that will attract fish in, in, in large numbers. We're going to identify them so that they're, they're at the right depths, so they provide the most benefit to the types of fish we're going after. So generally between you know, 6 and, and 12 feet of water, depending on the lake. Um, some lakes will go deeper. A lot depends on the, the chemistry of the lake and the limnology of the lake. Sportfish likely to use these new homes include largemouth bass, yellow bass, smallmouth bass, bluegill, sunfish, channel catfish, and tilapia. But we'll try to place them in groups so that they actually provide a, a mosaic of habitat in clumps. We might put four or five in one group and then move to another location in four or five. Air is let out of the bladder, the reef sinks, leaving behind the empty bladder. Now all that's needed are the anglers. What I found uh, in, in my uh, travels across the valley, uh, four or five in the afternoon, I can stop and fish at Tempe Town Lake for 15 or 20 minutes, have a good time, defuse, de-stress, and get home at the same time, whether I'm sitting in traffic or fishing. So it's a good place to hang out. As Arizona's population increases, so will impacts on fish, wildlife, and even our ability to enjoy the great outdoors. When Tempe Town Lake was initially on the drawing boards, these impacts were addressed. 
planners recognize that we humans are part of the natural environment, and if we're to conserve these habitats, we're going to have to act. You know, our hallmark of, of all the habitat projects we've done on the Salt River Lakes uh, most recently, we have relied on, and our strength is, is the use of volunteer anglers and, and sports persons. Uh, it's something that we couldn't do. We readily accept that we could not do this on our own. Behind us you'll see, oh, probably a dozen and a half, two dozen volunteers from various uh, groups, organized fishing groups, uh, general conservationists, and, and we're here to do one thing, and that's to make fishing in the future better and to give a little bit back uh, from the, the heritage that we've uh, benefited from, which is, which is fishing uh, here in the state. Game and Fish does not receive state general funds to pay for activities like this. Only when hunters and anglers open up their wallets to purchase their license and show up to work events like this can great things happen for all of us. Uh, there, there's a lot of challenges we face for fishing for anglers in the future. And, and from climate change to urban growth to water demands, and, and a lot of those we can't control. But habitat for fish is something we can control and we can make a difference on. And that's why I'm excited about the use of these reef balls because while it takes a lot of work to put them in, no matter what type you put in, these are going to last for hundreds of years and provide benefit to angling, anglers and the fish for hundreds of years. And I think that's a win-win. We've got upcoming generations that's going to be fishing. You know, it's not just about me, it's not about you, it's not about the guys that are here. It's about the people coming after us. This is a future. If we don't do something now, our lakes are fairly devoid of any habitat out here in the desert areas. This is for the future. This is for the people who come after us. It's for the little 8, 10, 12 year old kids. They will reap the benefits of what we're doing today. This event today is a shoot between military and civilians and branch and branch. This is a fun event. The com competition is um, horrendous because you know you have that branch against branch type of thing. Our military are really great shooters and they really are when it comes to war weapons, but when it comes to 12 and 20 gauge shotguns, they're at a kind of a same level playing field and probably civilians are probably better. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a fun event. Oh. Our service members and their families are heroes. Some are everyday heroes and some are uncommon ones. Most would not consider themselves heroes, rather they tell us they were just doing their job. And in their case, doing their job means preserving our freedom. Even heroes need some help. Some of the reasons that our military need assistance are because um, they may have been a reservist and had a civilian job and then they're activated as a reservist and they lose the civilian pay. They lose that differential fund that can help them over a hump for if there's a Murphy's Law type of incident. So if you've got a husband that's deployed and a wife over here and the car breaks down, you know, they may have planned for the, the rent and they may have planned for the electricity, but they may not have planned for a vehicle repair. We all know how costly those can be. Also, we do a lot of things for um, morale, and that includes like events like today where the military do not have to pay to shoot. We also give out tickets for our military for um, events, and we give um, back to school supplies to our military children, and we have a Christmas uh, program. We have an Adopt-A-Family program also for the holidays. So there's a lot of things we do besides financial, and having this event today is one of those morale events. Celebrating 10 years of service to our heroes, Operation Homefront is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was formed in February 2002. Developed to support the families of deployed service members immediately following 9-11, they now serve all American military personnel and or their families. Operation Homefront uh, has helped me and my family uh, with school supplies and once they actually helped me fix my truck which uh, leave, relieve a lot of uh, debt as, as far as my, on my family. So that's how they helped me and uh, felt great. In addition to school supplies for the kids, other services available range from rent, mortgage, utilities, temporary lodging, vehicle expenses, car payments, car insurance, airfare to transport a family member to assist a military family during illness or for childbirth, 
childcare during illness or surgery, and even critical baby items and other emergency financial needs. Because they helped me, it uh, helped me concentrate on my, my duties and not worry about finance uh, and uh, know that my kids got backpacks and stuff like that. It takes the laugh off my shoulder. Financial struggles exacerbate an already difficult time of life. While Operation Homefront is not a long-term solution for chronic financial problems and can only provide enough assistance for one week of food per client family, they are able to provide emergency food assistance to those families that find themselves in a budget crunch and will assist clients in identifying additional resources. Okay, now when I fish this drop shot bait, there's some key things that I want to do with it. All right, I want to make sure that I stay very connected to this bait. That's the most important thing. I will not feel the bite if I have slack in my line, okay? So there's three phases that I like to call. I, I'm going to cast right down the center of this channel. We talked about these fish should be backed out right in here, all right? I'm going to obviously let it go to the bottom. Um, once it hits the bottom, there's three things that I do. Okay, the first thing is I immediately get myself to as taut of line as I can without moving the bait. Okay, I'm not quite there. There. Now I can feel that I'm snug with the line. Okay, that's for me I call that check mode. All right, I haven't moved the bait yet. I'm just checking to see if anything's there. Kind of like catfishing with a fork and you on shore, you cast it out, you put your rod in a fork, you get the line tight. Why? So that you can see the bite, right? Well, if I have slack in this line, I'm not going to feel the bite. So the first thing I'm doing again is keeping a nice taut line and I decide nothing's biting. Okay, now I'm going to lift real gentle and I'm going to check it. Okay, I don't feel anything mushy. There's such thing called a pressure bite, which you cannot detect. There is no thump thump. It's just pressure. It almost feels like you hooked a wet sponge. So you're checking it, okay? You've kept the taut line, you've checked it, nothing's there. Now you're gonna slide the bait in small increments. Believe me, you can't go slow enough. Sometimes you wanna only move it one or two inches at a time. Once you've moved it, you go right back to the check mode, which is a taut line. So the three phases are taut line, check mode, check the bait, kind of gently lift, slide the bait, and or shake the bait. There's your three phases of fish in this drop shot. You want to be very careful. Hook sets are free. If something feels funny, wind two cranks down and set the hook, okay? It doesn't hurt anything to set the hook. Worst case, maybe your worm will ball up and you simply fix it. Okay, another thing, I want to show you what this bait should look like in the water. Okay, when you actually have this bait floating, if you notice how perfect it is, it's perfectly upright, it's not turned on its side. If I drag it through the water, you'll notice it's nice and straight. Okay, when I move the bait, it has a nice paddle tail action. It's not a paddle tail bait, but it's actually not rotating, it's not swirling, turning to the left, turning to the right, it's straight. That's very important with the presentation of this worm. You'll also notice with the knot and the, that we tied, how that worm stands straight out, okay? That's the effects that you want to have in your drop shot worm right there to catch fish.
Have you ever wanted to catch a trout that was so big you didn't have to lie about it? Well, Arizona Game and Fish has been adding some supersized trout to lakes across the state to give anglers a little something extra to try for. The Game and Fish Hatchery at Canyon Creek is nestled under the Mogollon Rim in the Tonto National Forest and sits at 6,600 feet elevation. The hatchery raises approximately 240,000 catchable sized trout and 500 to 750,000 fingerlings each year. It is fairly common for this hatchery to have thousands of eggs and small fish in the hatchery building during the spring and summer months. To grow a fish to catchable size takes about 24 to 30 months, but it can take up to seven years to grow these incentive trout that live in the hatchery show pond, and they can weigh up to 15 pounds. In order to transport these fish, the hatchery workers herd them to one end of the pond with a big net called a seine, where they are hand netted and placed in this specially designed fish tank. Once about a hundred large trout are loaded, this truck is ready for the short trip to Woods Canyon Lake. On this weekend, more than 1,200 of these big rainbow trout, ranging in size from two to 10 pounds, come from several different game and fish hatcheries, will be scattered across not only Woods Canyon Lake on the Mogollon Rim, but also City Reservoir near Williams, Rose Canyon Lake on Mount Lemon, and Fane Lake near Prescott. Large trout like these are regularly added to the normal trout stockings that take place throughout the year. Okay, Jeffy, grab a side. Grab hold the other side. Every fish truck operator can always use a little help when it comes to offloading the trout into the lake. And these youngsters were more than happy to oblige. <laughs> out because I kind of touched it sometimes how smooth it was. Oh she had fun. She was laughing and smiling the whole time. <laughs> they were huge. I, I still can't believe how big they were but I'm gonna beg my grandma and grandpa to see if we could come here tomorrow because I want to catch one of those bad boys. People weren't the only ones interested in these big trout. A pair of bald eagles who call this lake home were also keeping a watchful eye on their prospective dinner. These big trout tend to go to the deeper, colder water, so the best way to catch them is to drop your line and bait as deep into the lake as possible. A valid fishing license is needed to try for these large fish, and one can be purchased at licensed dealers, game and fish offices, or online. Fishing is a great way to get outdoors and spend quality time on your own or with friends and family. It's a happy girl. I got one. You got one? You sure? Wouldn't you like to catch this guy? Well, that's our show for tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. For more information on Arizona Game and Fish, visit our website. For producers Carol Lind and Gary Schaefer, I'm Jim Paxson. We'll see you next week.